All right, so this is the first one, first lecture today is by Liam Baker, and it will be on Grinfield Modular Fault. Thank you. Um, so I'll be speaking about Grenfeld modular forms, which were modular forms which Grenfeld, as far as I know, never considered. Um, so uh, first I'll give a brief introduction or reminder of how, what modular forms are in the classical case. So they have analytic functions on the upper half plane that have important number theoretic properties. Um, so it's a function which satisfies the following properties. It has to be nicely analytic and differentiable. Um, it satisfies what looks like a strange condition the first time you see it. Um, so if on a Mobius transform of Z is related to F of Z in some nice way. And also as the, your imaginary part of Z goes to infinity, your function should be bounded. And then this leads to a lot of nice uh, properties of these modular forms. The second condition can be written in a slightly different way. Uh, F of gamma acting on Z, where gamma is an element of SL2Z, uh, is related to F of Z with this factor of automorphy over here. Uh, modular forms can have different weights. Uh, from your weight can be any uh, integer K from zero and upwards. And yeah, so this is the usual classical definition of a modular form, at least for SL, SL2Z. Um, for a more general, but this is just a different way of writing um, the action of SL2Z on the upper half plane and how that second condition can be rephrased in terms of these slash operators, uh, where F slashed with a, a gamma, which is a matrix, is a different function, which is this factor of automorphy times F of gamma Z. So that second condition we had on the previous slide can just be written that in a different way, saying that F slashed with any matrix gamma should just stay the same. So it's symmetric in a certain way. And this is a group action on the set of functions on the upper half plane. So that's a modular form for the full um, uh, subgroup. Uh, you can also define modular forms for any congruent subgroup. Uh, which is any <laughs> subgroup of a principal congruent subgroup, and those are stuff that looks like all the all the matrices which are one or yeah congruent to one mod some integer, so you can have mod five or matrices which are one mod five. Uh, so that is a principal congruent subgroup, and a modular form for that subgroup can be defined uh, similarly to before. It has to be nice and complex analytic. Uh, the previous condition uh, would say that F slashed with any matrix should stay the same for any matrix in SL2Z. Here we're only restricting that for gamma in whichever subgroup we've chosen, so it's less conditions. And to compensate, we have to strengthen the boundedness condition, saying that each of these slashes, they are all bounded as the imaginary part goes to infinity. So that's usual definition of um, modular forms. And this is usually phrased as being holomorphic at the cusps. Great. Uh, now there's a different definition for classical modular forms, which I actually prefer. And these are defining them as functions on the space of lattice of rank two. Uh, so that's a rank two additive subgroup. So it'll look something like this. So this would be a lattice. So you would have them as functions on the space of lattices. So as the lattice varies, your function changes. Uh, so the definition when you're phrasing them as functions of lattices are, is as follows. So first of all, your F has to be analytic. There's a bit of a question mark there because you have to define what do you mean a function on the space of lattices to be analytic. So you just need to give the space of lattices some analytic structure. Um, then the other condition with the factor of automorphy that gets written more simply as saying that your F is homogeneous of degree negative K. So if you scale the lattice, your F also behaves similarly. 
And the last condition, the holomorphic at the cusps, gets rephrased as saying that your value of your function is bounded as long as the smallest non-zero element of your lattice is not too close to the origin. And uh, these definitions are equivalent. Uh, if you have a complex number Z in the upper half plane, you can make a lattice by just uh, defining your lattice to be Z times integers plus integers. So that's the lattice that you can use and you can go vice versa. So these, these two definitions are equivalent. And if you wanna do a modular form for the congruent subgroup, you also need to adjoin a lattice with a level structure, which is a bijection between the end torsion points of the lattice and of integers. Great. So that's a brief introduction to or reminder of classical modular forms. Now we're moving over into the world of function fields, and this is where Grunfeld modular forms are defined. Um, a lot of it is very analogous. So if you're used to classical modular forms, you can um, see an analog here. So we define a field, a, a global function field F, which where the classical analog would be the rational numbers. We define an absolute value on F and the analog would be the normal or absolute value on, uh, that should be on Q. Um, we pick for that absolute value, we pick all the elements which are regular away from an infinity. That's in the analog is the integers. Uh, we can complete F with respect to our absolute value and the analog is the real numbers because when you complete the rationals, you get the reals and you get the complex numbers. Uh, in the classical case, you just complete the real numbers. Here you have to, sorry, you take algebraic closure. Here you have to take the algebraic closure and then take the completion again, but then it is algebraically closed once you do that. Okay. Uh, if you want more concrete, um, okay, and we also have FQ is the field of constants of F and Q is, it would be any prime power then. And if you want a better analogy or a more concrete analogy, you can say your integers are uh, polynomials, coefficients in a finite field, your rationals would just be uh, rational functions, coefficients in a finite field, and your reals would be uh, one-sided Laurent series. And then complex numbers are just uh, algebraically closed after that. Great. Okay, so looks very analogous there. This seems to be one-to-one -one correspondence. There are some key differences between the classical and the uh, finite field or function field case. Here, the rings are finite characteristic and the uh, absolute value is non-Archimedean. So in some analysis senses, it behaves very different to the real numbers and complex numbers. Um, the analog of the integers generally doesn't have prime factorization, but you can still prime factorize ideals. So whereas previously we had uh, congruent subgroups gamma n, where n is an integer, yeah, we would have it where n is any proper ideal of your ring of integers. Uh, the biggest or most relevant difference here is that the analog of the complex numbers has infinite dimension as a vector space over the analog of the real numbers. So normal complex numbers has uh, dimension two over reals. Here, the dimension is infinite. As a result, in the Classical case, you can only have a lattice of rank two. You can't have higher, and otherwise you're going to start having elements which are arbitrarily close to the origin. Here, because the dimension is higher, you can have lattices of arbitrarily high rank. Okay, and that's what enables the theory of modular forms of higher rank. Okay, speaking of modular forms of higher rank, most of the work on what these are called Drenfeld modular forms are done in also on rank two because it's analogous with the classical case and also because you can also see them as functions of one variable. But if you want to do modular forms of higher rank, um, there are two main people who have established a theory of these. Uh, recently, Gekele, who only did it in the case of uh, FQT, which are the like simpler case that I showed you on the side, and Basson, Bloria, and Pink for general F. So they have a theory or written some papers establishing 
general theory of modular forms of higher rank. Uh, their theory, uh, at least they write it, is as functions of R minus one variable. So rank two, you have a function of one variable. For rank three, you add a function of two variables and so on. Whereas my PhD thesis, which was a few years ago, um, establish a theory instead of viewing them as functions of variables, you have view them as functions on the space of lattices of higher rank. Okay, and currently I'm still busy filling out the theory from this point of view as functions of lattices. Okay, so how do we actually define them as functions of lattices? Well, first of all, a lattice is a projective A submodule of the analog of the complex numbers. In other words, it looks like that, so where those are ideals, because they're not necessarily principal, we have to go with general ideals, and those are F infinity independent complex numbers. So that's what a lattice looks like. You can define a level structure in the same way as a, a bijection between the end torsion points. And then we denote the space of lattices with level end structure as L in R and space of lattices without level structure as just L R or lattices of rank R. And we can prove or we can give analytic structure to this space by identifying it with a double quotient. This is uh, very similar to what Drinfeld did in his original paper where he did part of the Langlands or did work towards part of the Langlands conjecture. This is in a different direction, uh, but yes, short story, we can give analytic structure to these spaces of lattices with level structure. And because we can give analytic structure to them, we can define what a holomorphic or analytic function is. Yeah. And that's one of the three ingredients we needed to define um, modular forms. We need a definition of what it means to be holomorphic. Uh, we need to say that it's homogeneous, but that's easy enough to write down, homogeneous of weight negative k. And the last condition is we need to have some kind of condition when it goes to the cusps. So uh, the way I handled it is defining metrics on the spaces of uh, lattices with level structure or without. And once you have a metric, you can take the completion of this metric and um, skipping, I'm not actually writing down what exactly the metric is here, uh, but once you complete it, suffice to say that the boundary consists of also these same spaces of lattices with level structure, but with lower rank. So if you have the space of rank three, the boundary will consist of spaces of rank two and rank one. And okay, so then we can define what a modular form of weight K and rank R, this K in here is the, basically the principal congruence subgroup in this case. I'm skipping over some details here. So it's holomorphic on the interior, um, on the space of lattices of rank R. It's homogeneous of degree negative, negative K. That's easy enough to write down. And it has to be continuous uh, on the completed space, which basically means it has to be continuous at the boundary. So as you go from a lattice of rank R and one of your generating elements goes to infinity, the way the matrix is defined, the limit is then the lattice of rank R minus one made by the other generators. And because it's continuous, that limit should work. So that's how I defined modular forms of higher rank. Um, and I'm currently extending this theory, uh, proving, still busy proving what are some standard things for Drenkov modular forms or for modular forms in general. One is proving that they have these uh, Fourier type series expansions at the cusps. Um, and secondly, defining Hecker operators and proving the recursive properties that are common for them. And once we have Hecker operators, we can talk about eigenforms and so on and so on. Right. So that's one part of the work that I'm currently working on. The other part of work that I'm working on is specifically on rank two, on a different question. So for rank two, you can, there are common uh, modular forms specifically, uh, as an example, there's the Eisenstein series. 
Um, this is the Eisenstein series of weight one. And because of the non Archimedean analysis here, even the weight one modular forms do converge nicely. Okay. And uh, Connellson has proved that in the case of FQT, the graded algebra of Grinfeld modular forms of actually any rank are generated by Eisenstein series and possibly some cusp forms of weight too. Um, I should actually mention. Uh, if you have a modular form of weight three and another one of weight five, if you multiply them, you get weight eight. So that's how the graded algebra comes about. So the question is, oh, I have this algebra. It is, uh, if you stick to a specific weight, it is finite dimensional as a vector space. And the question is, what can I write some generators for them? And yes, Eisenstein series and possibly some cusp forms of weight two, but it's not clear whether we actually need these cusp forms of weight two, maybe only the Eisenstein series are enough. And basically I have some partial computational results. I have an algorithm, which if you put in a specific value of n, you can run the algorithm and it can tell you yes or no. Okay, um, so now I think you're uh, yes, uh, in this case, we're oh, doing FQT, so it's principal, so N is just, yeah. Uh, the algorithm basically comes down to make a matrix, calculate the rank of the matrix, but as N grows larger, this matrix gets very big, so it gets very computationally intensive. So I can do it for small N, but yes, I'm still working on that. And yep, that's it. Yeah. Questions? Uh, is there an analog of a theta function? Um, yes. Um, I think uh, if I remember correctly, like Ramanujan had these uh, derivatives, or he defines differential operator on modular forms. You can do very similar things over here for Grenfell modular forms, and yeah, you get theta functions and things as well. Yes. Uh, these rectifications that you mentioned. Yes. What, what sort of objects are they? Are they, uh, do they live in rigid analytic geometry? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the interiors are rigid analytic. Um, and each of the components of the boundary are also rigid analytic, but of one dimension less. So, yes, in a sense. Yes. Is it, uh, is it as usual like section of some land bundle of a modulary space of the church module? Yeah. And yeah. do you have nice compartification of those modulary spaces? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you do. Um, my work, I try to avoid the algebraic geometry. So, I don't talk about sheaves and line bundles and all that stuff. But, yes. That is very much true. Because for arithmetic property, you would need geometry. I hope that you could understand the Fourier expansion in mm -hmm. terms of structural infinity, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yep. I was going to ask a question. I, what, what is the relation between this moduli space of lattices and uh, and then these compactifications and like the moduli of like, Stuka with one, like the moduli of Stuka there's a compactification? Um, the short answer is that I don't know Stuka. Okay. Yes. For uh, GL2, uh, I think that a few years ago there was some comparison between uh, the reduction of this modular form on the photomorphic form mod P. For, for, uh, is there some relation with the uh, automorphic form um, P? So I don't know, and I'm not sure if there is, because as far as I understand it, automorphic forms are complex valued. And so saying that they're analytic means one thing, but here these are function field yes. valued. So I think they're talking about different things, but there are probably some deep connections here as well. 
All right, well, it looks like you've come to the right place. So, yeah, thanks.